Welcome back to another episode of Dreading, or if this is your first time here, welcome. On July 22nd, 2022, we released the video, The Fictional Case of Jesse Smollett. The video was the result of weeks of research and compiling of facts, including interviews from when Jesse was a child, his singing career prior to Empire, and a fan blog from 2011 that appeared as if Jesse ran himself. The video had originally been uploaded a week prior, premiering on Patreon much earlier and at the time, had every piece of information about the case, including Jesse's statements prior to arrest, his statements in court, and more. But the day before it was made public, Jesse would go on to be interviewed by the radio show Sway's Universe, which was his first public interview since being released from prison. In the interview, he doubled down on his story, made a plethora of false statements, and I have been asked to go over the interview in full. This video will serve as a part two to my initial coverage, and if you haven't seen the first video, I recommend you pause this one and watch it. I will have it linked below as well as in the iCard in the video. But for those who understandably do not want to rewatch that video, let me summarize the situation as best I can. Jesse Smollett is an American actor who had been working in the industry since childhood. According to multiple interviews, he got his SAG award when he was just four, despite starting to work when he was around nine or ten. He began his career doing modeling as a child and appeared as an extra in a couple of movies. Shortly thereafter, his entire family had a show on ABC called On Our Own, and though it was canceled after one season, it would serve as a jumping off point for most of his siblings in the entertainment world. After the show failed to get renewed, he took a short break from acting and focused mainly on school. It wasn't until 2012 that he would make his career comeback in the movie The Skinny. He also began to pursue a career in music, which failed to go anywhere. It wouldn't be until 2014 when Jesse was cast in the Fox show Empire that his career would crescendo into mainstream success. Jesse played Jamal Lyons, a gay black musician who struggled to gain his father's approval. The media praised Jesse's portrayal of Jamal in season one, along with his singing ability, and his role led him to getting signed with a record deal. Despite the numerous success, Jesse felt like the label and the record deal were stifling his creativity, and he would leave the label without putting out any music. He then started his own label, The Music of Sound, to release his debut record, Sum, spelled S-U-M, of my music. However, his solo music failed to gain the audience that the music he had performed on the show had, and Jesse was quoted in a number of interviews saying that most of his fans didn't even know he made music outside of the show. Later on, his character's importance to the overall plot of Empire would wane considerably, and after one season, he would no longer be asked to do solo press tours, leading to his managers being unable to negotiate a better contract for him. Jesse didn't have the name brand recognition like his co-stars, meaning that he wasn't bringing any more eyes to the show, and it wouldn't make sense to give him more money. Jesse's career wasn't at a standstill by any means. He had gained thousands of fans, was on a relatively popular show, and could easily leverage that into more work. If anything, he had hit one of his first roadblocks, which could have easily been overcome. His management gave him the advice that he should focus on gaining some amount of brand recognition, as that could be leveraged into more money, which Jesse took to mean fake a hate crime for media and press attention. Jesse contacted the Osandero brothers, two men who had worked as extras on Empire and that Jesse had become friends with. One of the brothers was a middleman for Jesse to get drugs, and they had formed a small kinship off of that. Jesse told the brothers he wanted them to pretend to beat him up on the side of the street, to yell racial slurs and homophobic slurs at him, and to scream that this is MAGA country as they pretend to hit him. He wanted the attack to be captured on film, so he showed the brothers where the security cameras were on the street outside of his apartment, and he assured them that he wouldn't be getting the police involved. The brothers agreed, and during a polar vortex in Chicago on January 29th, 2019, at 2 a.m., the brothers pretended to jump him outside of his apartment complex, poured a very minimal amount of bleach on him, and put a makeshift noose around his neck. The attack resulted in no damage being done to Jesse, minus a few bumps and bruises. An expert would later testify to the fact that some of the bruises and cuts on Jesse that had been documented were done by him and not the brothers, which was done to make himself look worse after. Jesse had been on the phone with his manager at the time and planned to use him as a secondary witness to the attack. He then went inside to see his creative director, Frank Gatson, who forced Jesse to get the police involved. Jesse tried to maintain he didn't want any police involvement due to the police brutality against black people. However, Frank told him 
that there was no reason to assume that the police would brutalize him in his own apartment when he was a victim of a crime. Jesse would end up filing a police report, and shortly thereafter, the crime became worldwide news. Jesse told the police that two men had jumped him and attacked him in the middle of the night, that he couldn't give a full physical description of them, besides that one of the men was about 170 pounds. He would later tell TMZ that the men who attacked him were white, and that one was wearing a MAGA hat, which he hadn't mentioned in the police interviews. His representatives confirmed this detail three times with TMZ before they reported it, which led to the police questioning the authenticity of his story as he was changing details of it. Within two weeks, the police were able to track down the brothers and speak to them in conjunction with the crime, to which they admitted their part in it. They shared the text communications they had with Jesse prior to the event, showing his prior knowledge to the crime. Jesse was then arrested and booked for filing a false police report. However, in a month's time, all charges against Jesse were dropped. The head prosecutor, Joe Maggots, stated that dropping the charges did not mean that Jesse hadn't taken part in the crime or that he was innocent, as all the evidence showcased his planning. Instead, he stated that the reason the charges had been dropped was because it was a non-violent crime and that Jesse had no prior criminal history. Jesse's defense team made a deal with the prosecution that in exchange for the 16 hours of community service and the forfeit of his $10,000 bond, Jesse would go free. Jesse's publicist and lawyers tried to claim, falsely, the dropping of the charges was because he was innocent and there had been no proof against him, despite even the head prosecutor stating otherwise. The move to drop the charges was contentious to say the least, leading to an investigation of the prosecution's actions in the case, which many believed had been biased and favorable to Jesse. This made it so that Jesse could be charged once more. In February 2020, Jesse was once again indicted, this time by the Cook County Grand Jury, this time of six counts of felony disorderly conduct pertaining to making four false police reports. In November 2021, he was found guilty and sentenced to serve 150 days in county jail and two and a half years probation. He was likewise ordered to pay restitution to the city of Chicago, roughly equivalent to the amount they had spent on the false investigation. Jesse was sentenced to immediately start serving his sentence, and before he was taken to jail, he addressed the court saying this. Do you have any questions? Okay. I am not suicidal. Okay. I am not suicidal. I am innocent and I am not suicidal. If I did this, then it means that I stuck my fist in the fears of black Americans in this country for over 400 years and the fears of the LGBTQ community. Your Honor, I respect you and I respect the jury, but I did not do this and I am not suicidal. And if anything happens to me when I go in there, I did not do it to myself. And you must all know that. I respect you, Your Honor. I respect your decision. Jail time. I am not suicidal. Okay. Jesse repeated that he was not suicidal and alluded to cases of people being killed in prison and it being covered up, akin to Jeffrey Epstein. But after entering prison, Jesse would be placed in the psychiatric ward of the prison. According to his brother, he went on to say that they had noted that Jesse was a risk for suicidal harm and alluded to the prison being an unsafe environment for Jesse, especially since Jesse had made the statement prior to his imprisonment. This led some reactionaries to state that Jesse was being abused. He was not, but we will discuss that in a moment. After six days, Jesse was released on appeal from his lawyers. He maintained his innocence after getting out of prison and compared himself to multiple civil rights leaders who had been unfairly imprisoned. That is the short summary of everything that occurred prior to the interview that we are going to be going over right now. Again, for a more detailed look, feel free to watch the original video. Since his release, Jesse has gone on to direct his first movie, B-Boy Blues, which is streaming on BET+. The following is the first interview Jesse had done after prison, promoting the movie, which was done on the radio show, Sway's Universe. As you will see, Jesse is very close to the two interviewers, and they both don't think Jesse took part in the crime. That was the trailer from <laughs> the new hit on BET+. Plus. It's called B-Boy Blues. Yeah. Citizens, <laughs> it's a hit. It's streaming crazy. <laughs> Sometimes, man, all you need is another hit. Just hit my people. People. What you do? What you do? B Boy Blues, directed and EP'd and co-written, co-written, financed, financed. 
he carried this baby in his arms and brought it to life and was able to get it placed on BET+. Plus. That's not all he's done. Have to be this man has been making money since the Mighty Ducks, man. This dude has been putting it <laughs> down since 1992. Round of applause, man. That's what 1992 is. 30 years. 30 yeah. years ago. Not many of us could talk 30 years in this entertainment That's game. That's three decades, boy, 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 boy. Got my sad card in 1987. You better act wow. like you know. I'm old. I know you saw him on Alien. I saw him on Alien. I don't know how he got that role. He must have needed to check. Listen, I don't know either. I know you saw him on Empire because he was the reason I was on Empire. Oh, my brother. They don't wow. talk about that part. Y'all wonder why I ride with this dude so cold. I want to welcome him back in person, the one and only Jesse Small Ass Citizen. I love y'all. Hello. Man. Love I'm you so too. So happy to be here. So happy to be here. Happy to have you, In brother. person. In person. Title those text messages yeah, whenever man. you want. <laughs> those when I want something text messages. Shut your <laughs> ass <laughs> up, Sway. How many something. times I done invited you right to my place, right up the street from him? Hey, check it. Ask Every Sway time. if he ever been in my place. You've been a million times. You and Uzi. What happened to you, Sway? What's up, Did Sway? You, first of all, he's not in town when he invites me. <laughs> <laughs> to invite me I'll just to be like, place. yeah, come over. I'll be like, over. and then he but shows I up there like, bro, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not there for a couple. <laughs> he ain't going to be there. So it got to the point when Jussie texts me, I hit him back, what? What you need? Shut up, Sway. And you got to know. Why he lying, though? Because it's birthday. Y'all birthday coming up. When's your birthday, Sway? <laughs> See what I mean? <laughs> When's my birthday? <laughs> July. <laughs> yeah. Okay. June twenty first. <laughs> he gonna say he, he probably gonna say that the date of my birthday is the party date because he just got the invitation to the party. Yeah, he got oh, a party. So, oh, okay. <laughs> Jesse Smollett celebrating his fortieth birthday. Yeah. Congrats. Man. Look at this 40. guy, man. Lost That's his forty. Man, I, it's so much I want to talk to you about. First yeah. and, and foremost, um, how's your spirit? My spirit is so. In such the season of gratitude, okay. like my my spirit is, I've never felt more more clear. Mm -hmm. um, mm. I've never felt more sober. I've never felt more. Um, I hope people don't take that out of context, but mm -hmm. I'm sure they will. <laughs> right, right. But, Boy, I was already but, about to follow you know up. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But um, I've never felt healthier uh, and more grateful and more. I've never felt more blessed than than I feel now. So my spirit is, you know, is really good. I'm still, you know, still dealing with things, still, you know, having to, you know, I'm not shy to say that I am in therapy mm -hmm. as we all should be because a lot of stuff that happened over the last three years, obviously, but also just, you know, just life stuff. Yeah. You know, you gotta, yeah. you gotta be able to, you gotta be able to train your mind and not just train your body, mm -hmm. you know, to, to be healthy and to be, to be beautiful. So um, I'm really, really, I'm getting out of the idea of trying to convince or trying to um, hope that people see the truth of something or yeah. something like that. And I'm really just, I'm going where the love is. Much like the interview Jesse did with Robin Roberts about the fake attack, which we analyzed in our first video, Jesse makes it a point to notate that what he is saying is the truth and that he never lied, that he is done trying to convince people of his innocence or convince them at all, as he stands on the side of the truth, which is ridiculous to most people who know anything about the case. It's also entirely unhelpful to Jesse's public persona to continue to state things like this, as he has been caught in multiple lies throughout the case, like when he claimed he never stated that the men who assaulted him were white and wearing MAGA hats, when he confirmed that with TMZ three times prior to them running the story, or when he claimed that he didn't know who attacked him, when he was well acquainted with the brothers and had been for a while. So much so that in his legal defense, his lawyers claimed that Jesse had had sex with one of them. If Jesse was trying to repair his credibility in his public image, it would have been beneficial to admit to some wrongdoing in the situation. That way he could appear humble and self-reflective. Although it's obvious he would never admit to planning the attack, especially because the case is still being appealed. Admitting to a smaller lie or action on his part would have helped him ingratiate himself to the public. In accepting some small part of responsibility for what occurred, many people would think that he had learned his lesson and he was on his way towards making amends. But his denial of reality and the bevy of evidence showing his guilt only serves to alienate him further from the wider public and encourages fans to reject all the evidence that has come out against him. 
any remaining fans he has are now put in the uncomfortable position of having to ignore all the evidence against him and deny reality to support him. And that's why I'm Ooh. here. You won't see me everywhere. Mm -hmm. I'm not doing a lot of press, yeah. but it's yeah. like I'm going where the love is. And why shouldn't I? You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Why should we subject ourselves to to unnecessary pain or, or, or salaciousness or whatever? It's like, that's why I come home to family. What Jesse is doing here is trying to characterize only going on shows that are entirely supportive of him and are biased towards him as self-care, when really it's a clear sign that his claims and statements cannot hold up to very minimal examination. He doesn't want to be held up to speculation or have to acknowledge any wrongdoing publicly, so he refuses to be put in that position. If he had evidence to show he was innocent, if that evidence was concrete and it would fully exonerate him, he would be doing so every press event he could without worry of being questioned further, because he is innocent, even if he didn't have any evidence. If he knew he was being truthful throughout and his story had never changed, he wouldn't feel as if the story didn't hold up to basic scrutiny scrutiny because he would be saying the same story repeatedly. However, because there is so much damning proof against him, including the check for $3,000 he gave to the brothers, the Instagram messages of him talking to them the night of the attack, telling them that they would need to push the attack back because his plane had been delayed, and his consistent changing of the story to different media outlets and the police, he knows that the more he talks about it, the worse off he is legally. But he frames that as him being done with dealing with negativity in his life, and only spending time with those who believe his story. Uh, Jesse Smollett, um, I'm curious. You choking up, Sway? You crazy? Yeah, I'm a little, I'm a little, <laughs> I'm wavery right now, Jesse. <laughs> Tapped into a cord right there or something. Um, but you know, I'm, I'm always concerned. I'm always concerned with our people, and specifically, yeah. I'm always concerned with you. And I know this, this, um, this field we work in can be uh, heartless. Um, it could be ruthless. And it, it can be, be alienating. It could be alienating. You have all these people around you, but it's very, very alienating. And you know, when something like, you know, we all know what happened. Well, we don't all know what happened, but we all know the the scandal around it. Around the court um, case, right? Yes. Uh, I'm I'm so. It sounds so odd, but. Lord knows if I could go back and, and never go through any of this and never have my family or my close people to me ever have to experience what we've experienced, Lord knows that I would make sure that that, you know, happened, but, and that they, that we never went through what we've gone through. Uh, but there's a part of me that one of my good friends <laughs> said, you know, you may think now, and he said this probably in like April of 2019, he said, you know, you may look at everything now and think that this is bad, but at the end of the day, you needed to mow your lawn so you could see all the snakes in your grass. Ooh. And sometimes, sometimes we, and again, it goes back to what I was saying when I was on the phone with y'all about family is so important to me. Mm -hmm. So I'm always looking in every space that I'm in to create that sort of same feeling that I get when I'm around my family, that uh -huh. safety, that, that un unapologetic love and sometimes it can stab you in your foot yeah. you know um mm. but uh i'm just so i'm just, I, I i say it often and i say it a lot and i'm just like i think that it's best to it's better to say thank you to god the universe the ancestors your friends your family too much mm -hmm. than to not say it enough so and i know from the depths of my soul the way that god has brought me through and continues to, you yeah. know. So I'm just uh, y'all hear me. Y'all will hear me say the words "grateful" a lot, and I really, genuinely am. Jussie so. Smollett. Um, what's that? I the, love this fake audience, y'all. No, no, oh, come on, man! Don't be pulling the curtain back. You're a director. Jesse is once again trying to demonize all those who do not believe him in order to victimize himself. He is a martyr of his own making, both in the hate crime hoax and this interview, characterizing all the people who are no longer affiliated with him after his life was exposed as snakes is a clear and obvious attempt to try and say that he was wronged in this situation and deny any responsibility for what happened. He is trying to claim that everyone around him that left or even believed that he would be capable of what he was proven to have done was disingenuous and therefore a bad person. Which is comical, because again, he faked a hate crime. Juicy Smollier calling anyone immoral is absolutely incomprehensible. How could everyone turn their backs on him? He only faked a hate crime in order to get more money. This ain't nothing about the lighting and B-Boy Blues. Uh, 
peeling back the curtain. curtain. <laughs> um, I would imagine as I, I try to put myself in your shoes, mm-hmm. a couple of things. You know, you you went through a lot of public ridicule. <sighs> Yeah, from the same people the, that <laughs> that loved you and uplifted mm. you are the same folks that did not believe you. You know, there were a lot of folks who just to this day does not believe your story. How do you rectify that? How did you? Um, I don't. Yeah. I don't. Uh, there's a part of me that, you know, when I strip my when I strip my ego, when I strip my my personal emotions about it. In my personal situation, I'm the way that it was served to everybody. I absolutely understand why people felt betrayed, uh-huh. you know. Um, and I put that in my song, "Thank You God," where I was just like, I really overstand the reason why y'all felt betrayed. They had my own people thoughts going off the wall. That's right from LD to Don. I still got love for y'all uh-huh. because whatever they thought, they thought. And whatever the way that it was served, it was served. But that is also, I didn't know what was happening Uh then. I didn't know how, I I didn't know how bad it was getting. And I also didn't think, for whatever reason, I genuinely thought that people were going to be like, there's no way that he did some bullshit like that. Uh Uh You know, I'm just like, y'all know me. Like, y'all know that. And and I'm thinking, oh, well, people's history should mean something. Uh So they, and, and it's very interesting when someone uses, when someone lies on you over and over and then they pull and you know what is the lie, but then you're forced to acknowledge the truths around the matter as well. Uh-huh. And that's really painful as well because it's easy to just be like, that's a bullshit lie. I ain't do no fucking hoax. Fuck uh-huh. that. Uh-huh. But then at the same time, then they bring out drug stuff. Yeah. And then they bring, and then you're like, ooh, I did do that. Uh-huh. <laughs> like, ooh, I did do that. You know what I'm saying? Uh-huh. And it's uh-huh. like, and you're sitting there and you're like, but this doesn't have anything to do with what y'all are saying that I did do that I didn't do. In the Good Morning America interview Jesse did with Robin Roberts, Jesse made a claim that multiple outlets and reactionaries had been claiming that Jesse's fake assault was a grinder hookup that had gone wrong. He stated that the reporting and the narrative were destructive and obviously false, and that he was disgusted that people had reported that. However, no claim was ever made by any mainstream news outlet that I could find after directly searching for it. The claim that he is making here is incredibly similar, though it would later come out that Jesse used one of the Ascendero brothers as a middleman to get drugs. That did very little to sway public opinion on Jesse. Given the evidence of his collusion with the brothers had already come out, no one discredited Jesse's story because he had done drugs recreationally. They discredited the story because it didn't make any sense. He kept changing details and it was shown he had taken part in the planning of the attack. He also spends a good amount of time trying to imply that the media is to blame for his reputation being in ruins, as if the media had been against him from the beginning. But the initial coverage of the attack was incredibly favorable towards Jesse, with mainstream media outlets, including Fox News, reported on the crime, stating that Jesse was a victim of a racial attack. The people who spoke out against him or poked holes in his story initially were all denounced as being racist. It wasn't until the police did a press conference discussing how they tracked down the Osendero brothers via security cameras in their use of Uber the night of the attack, and the brothers were able to show proof that Jesse had in fact been involved, that the majority of the public, in their opinions, were swayed. Jesse was given every accommodation by the public, and the majority of press was incredibly sympathetic and kind to him prior to actual evidence coming forward about his involvement. But to say as much would be to admit that he has some responsibility in what occurred, and he cannot have that. It's incredibly clear that Jesse wants to appear to be a victim in this story, the same way he wanted to be a victim of a fake hate crime. Uh You know what I'm saying? So it it is what it is. I, I don't hold anybody. That's not entirely true. Okay. I do hold some people accountable for the things that they said, for the things that they did, for the ways that they reacted, because half of those people should have picked up the fucking phone and called me Uh because Uh they had my number, you know, Uh and they didn't. But I also understand that we sometimes operate off of fear and that when you're when you're kind of, you know, the whole mission is to alienate you so that everybody so that you are such. You are so just like 
vibrating in the wrong way and like all the shit around you is just wrong that people just have to step back. But I don't mind, I don't hold the people to anything that stepped back. I hold the people that went out there and said shit, mm -hmm. I hold them to something. And not the people that don't know me, yeah. but the people that do know me, fuck out of here. Y'all know better than that. Yeah. And y'all did that, that was some PR bullshit. And you know who you are. And I will not name names and I love everybody, but I don't like everybody. In most cases of deception, when questioning a guilty party, that person will most likely use convincing statements. This includes things like saying, you know me, you know I would never, or how could you think that of me? These statements seek to exonerate the guilty party on the basis of friendship or something other than fact, when if you didn't do something, you would simply just show that you didn't do that. If Jesse could counter the plethora of evidence that had been set out against him, he would have simply done that and done it in the press, or better yet, in court, which he didn't do seeing that he lost the court case due to the insurmountable evidence showing his involvement. But instead, he is trying to state that everyone who was around him that disavowed him and stated that faking a hate crime was a bad thing to do is a piece of garbage and should feel guilty for abandoning him, even though he did do that. You don't like everybody. And that's just real. Jesse Smollett. Um, <clears throat> there was a few entertainers. Um, I know Dave Chappelle with one of his specials. <laughs> <laughs> so it was funny to you. You didn't take it personal. <laughs> ah. Oh, no. Oh, Eddie. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, you know, what's so funny is that my nickname growing up was Juicy. <laughs> I'm like, nigga, you taking my fucking nickname. <laughs> the fuck? <laughs> but, you know, uh, that's a... It's a special situation. Um, I don't know how much I should say about that. I will say that, I will say this. I have seen Dave since. Okay. I have seen Dave since. Okay. And um, I didn't run up on no stage mm -hmm. like that dude at the Hollywood Bowl. You didn't right. do that? Didn't. That wasn't you? That I wasn't didn't. Jesse. I, I thought that was, okay, so that, that, that was in the rumor mill that that was Jesse Smollett no, that did that, no, tackled him, no? no. No, could you imagine? Could you imagine? Could you imagine? Look, I, and look, just to be clear, I'm not saying anything about the whole Will things. I want to make that clear before they try right, to, right, I'm right, talking right. about the Hollywood Bowl thing. Yeah. I'm just like, yo, if Will got all that stuff, imagine if I ran up on the stage, they'd be oh, like, yeah. bruh, and you're done again. <laughs> <laughs> and see. <laughs> Damn. Here's the cherry. I'm like, yo. So... No, but no. you and Dave seen each other since. I've seen him since, and uh, that's that's all I'm gonna say. I mean, there's there's uh, that's all I'm gonna say. Yeah, that's all I'm gonna say. Shout out to Dave Chappelle. Kendrick Lamar did a beautiful video with I Heart Part Five, you mm -hmm. know, and um, there was an interpolation, I guess, that of a facial expression. Your sure. face, your mm -hmm. image was seemed like it was fused in what was your thoughts about how did you process how did you interpret that i haven't seen honestly i haven't seen the whole video and that's the honest to god truth mm -hmm. uh -huh. sometimes i don't watch things just so that i can say truthfully that i haven't seen it. okay <laughs> but i certainly have obviously i know about it about and it, i've yeah. seen it jesse in the span of 10 seconds says he both hasn't seen the video and has he obviously has seen the video but it's important to note that prior to lying and saying he hadn't seen it, he makes mention of the fact that he is telling the honest to God truth. Many times when someone is about to lie, they will make statements like this, announcing they're about to be truthful and really mean what they're going to say. Strangely enough, those statements are usually only put in front of untruths, as most honest people don't feel the need to call out that they're being honest during conversations, as they will just be honest. I mean, he's brilliant. So I don't, I don't entirely know how to interpret it. In, interpret it. Mm -hmm. uh, interpret it. I don't know how exactly to interpret it, but I think that he's a phenomenal artist. So I just, you know, I don't, I don't really have any personal thoughts about it as much as I think that he's a brilliant artist, and you know, he's, he's. Uh, that's really all I can say about that. That's all you can say about yeah. that. This guy's been in training, man. Jesse Small. I've been training to, myself. Yeah, you understand I the <laughs> emotional, like, like discipline that is taking that it takes to yeah. how many videos I have in my phone from February of 2019, where I'm just going off and I'm just like, "This is bullshit," and y'all know what this is. Why are y'all fucking falling for the banana and the tailpipe in this way? I know that it's like, why now? 
Why is this so easy to believe? And, and but then of course, then you send it to your people, and they're like, "Don't, don't put that out. Don't. Uh -huh. You're too, you're too angry. You're too defensive. You're too this." But looking back, there's a part of me that wishes that I had done what I wanted to do of going out there. I didn't want to do an interview. Uh -huh. You know what I'm saying? And I don't want to get too deep, you know, because I, I love and respect Robin Roberts. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But I did not want to do that interview. That interview wasn't for me. That was for my character. As stated in the initial video, Jesse's interview with Robin Roberts was for his character, given that his character, Jamal, literally did an interview with her for his own scandal in the previous season of Empire, which was shockingly similar to the one he did. Likewise, the interview was an integral part of Jesse's PR after the stunt as he wanted to ingratiate himself with the public and cement his celebrity. He in no way was forced to do it by his team or management. And we know this because at that point, lawyers were already telling him to stop talking about what had happened because of the investigation. But Jesse wanted to be seen as a martyr for a cause and get wider name recognition, which is why he did the interview in the first place. Good Morning America is one of the biggest morning shows in the nation and has a much broader demographic than Empire, meaning that doing the interview was positive press for him. He was not forced into doing the interview. And moreover, he chose to do the interview with Robin rather than anyone else who might have been more critical of him because of his prior working relationship he had with her from the episode she did on Empire with him, similar to what he's doing in this interview. Uh, you know? What do you mean? Just meaning that... Oh, God, how deep do I get? If I'm going to get deep, I might as well get deep with my family. Um... Uh, yeah, I have to be very, very honest here in that I wanted to, I found myself, you know, I hadn't watched the interview at all. Uh, I hadn't watched the interview at all until we were on trial. Uh -huh. And I had to watch it because they were trying to use the interview as evidence of lies or whatever. They were trying to use the interview as evidence of lies or whatever because there was direct evidence of you lying in the interview because you lied in the interview. Jesse tries very nonchalantly to bury the lead in regards to certain facts surrounding the case and makes it sound as if it's not important, but it is. Um, so I had to watch it and I watched it and I was mortified. Uh -huh. I mean, I was mortified. I mean, I cringed at just the, every single word that I said in that interview was the truth. But there was a certain level of performative uh -huh. nature that came from it because I didn't want to be there. This, once again, is a lie, or as Jesse would say, a performance. Jesse wasn't 100% honest in the interview. We know that for a fact, given that he said he didn't know his attackers. He claimed his attackers were white, that he had no part in the attacks, that he never claimed that the attackers were wearing MAGA hats, when he absolutely did, and more. There were plenty of lies said during the interview, and this is why so many people talked about it afterwards, and it was dissected multiple times by professionals something which Jesse is no doubt aware of, given that there are videos with millions of views on them going over his body language and debunking his lies. But Jesse can't acknowledge that he lied about anything he said, because he has claimed absolutely no responsibility for any of his actions in this case, and wants to appear as angelic as possible in this scenario. But he needs to account for why his body language and his behavior was so off, and why it came across as if he were lying. Hence him saying he both didn't want to be there and he viewed it as an acting performance. It wasn't that he was lying because everything he said was 100% accurate. He was just acting like he was lying because that somehow makes more sense. The next portion of his response is incredibly indicative of that, as one of the main critiques people had for him at the time was his clear and obvious inferiority complex and how it was important to him to seem like he was tough in the interview and his performance when he stated he was the gay Tupac. And I was so angry and so offended that I had to go on national television and explain something that happened to me. And it was so political and it was all of those things. And I found myself, I found myself dealing with my own internalized homophobia. Okay. As an openly gay black man who leads with his blackness. I found myself dealing with that and I'm embarrassed and I'm a little bit ashamed to say that, meaning that I wanted to, I wanted to represent all of us that had been assaulted based on who we are, um, but for the people that didn't have the platform that I had. Uh -huh. I wanted to say all of the things that people 
should hear from people who have been through this. Um, but I also didn't want to be associated with people who had been attacked. Mm. Mm. I felt like somehow, like I want to, I want to, I want to play roles. I want to play boxer. I want to play, you know, you know, superheroes and all that type of shit. And and Jesse doesn't appear to realize that him talking about how he wanted to use the fame the attack brought him to get acting roles and be seen as a political figure is what people had accused him of. And he is blatantly admitting to wanting to do so here. He doesn't seem aware that saying he wanted to leverage the fame to speak on others' behalf and get film roles is exactly what the police, the Ascendero brothers, and others have accused him of. He says it so casually, and it's a wonder that no one has pointed it out. And then I felt like, I'm so... I'm 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 genuinely sorry to say this, but this is the way that I felt. I don't feel that way anymore, but I know that that's the way that I felt. I felt like I felt like I just became a faggot that got his ass beat. Mm-hmm. So, or at least I felt like that's what people saw me as. Mm-hmm. And so I was trying so hard to like the posturing of he hit me and then I hit his ass back. And I was just like, oh my god, nigga, what are you doing? You look fucking ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But everything that I said was the God to honest, honest to God truth. But it's just the way that it was. Yeah, I mean, I, I, again, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to my people that I felt that way. Mm-hmm. But that is that is a part of a bigger conversation that we should probably have at some point. Yeah, mm-hmm. about the internalized homophobia that we're kind of conditioned with from the moment that we get on this earth, mm-hmm. whether you end up being gay or not. Jesse basically just blamed internalized homophobia for the reason that it seemed like his story isn't believable. It's not that he lied; he just acted like he was lying. And it's something that I feel like a lot of us fight with and grapple with. And in order to explain certain things and explain certain whys, you kind of have to be fully honest with yourself about all of that. And that's just me being honest. So um, am I ashamed of that, that I felt that way? Absolutely. Do I feel like I'm, I'm better than anyone else that has been assaulted? Absolutely fucking not. Mm-hmm. But at that time, I was just so embarrassed that it happened. I did not want anybody. So that's why when people were just like, oh, he he did this so that he could, he did this so that he could get attention. And I'm just like, first of all, I've never been a person that looked for attention. Jesse saying he has never gone out of his way to get attention while being an actor and a singer is probably one of the most obvious lies he has told. But sure, the guy who seemingly ran a fan blog for himself had two television shows with his family, and was upset that his role on a television show was cut down, never wanted attention. That makes even more sense. But if I was, like I'm an actor, a director, yeah. a writer, a creator. He was on Mighty Ducks in 92. You know what I'm saying? Like quack, yeah. quack, motherfuckers. <laughs> if I were to do something, it would not be to look like a victim. It would be to look like, if anything, someone strong. Again, this narrative only works as a rebuttal if the party listening is somehow unaware of the fact that Jesse told the Ascendero brothers to let him hit them back during the attack because he wanted it to look like he had fought back against the attackers. Jesse said he wouldn't have staged all of this because he didn't want to be a victim, as if he hadn't stated he wasn't a victim in the press and as if he hadn't said he fought the fuck back in every statement he gave after. And I found myself being like, yo, but I'm strong, but I fought back and all of that type of stuff. And it was like, it actually doesn't make you more or less of a human being, Mm -hmm. regardless of what happened. Mm -hmm. And so we just didn't know what to expect. We didn't know what was coming. We didn't know who was going to lie. We didn't, there was just nothing to point us to that until it happened. And we were just dumbfounded and looking back. There were so many things that we could have done to intercept it, but we just didn't know what was coming. So that's that. Mm. <clears throat> and I won't, we're going we're gonna to move on, but you, you said something really interesting because I, I, used to, I used to get on the radio. I, I, I had to tell you, I was perplexed of why so much attention is being paid. Let, let's minim, I minimize it to this actor. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. You're more than that. But Thank why, you. why, you know, I'm just, you know, why is, is the whole world, world, you used to say, I used to say the whole world is coming down on this guy, on this actor, when we got so much other things we could be concerned about. This is a logical fallacy, and though Jesse didn't state this himself, it is important to rebut this line of thinking. 
because it's nonsense. If you commit a crime, people are allowed to feel how they feel about it, especially if the crime was made a public spectacle by you. You can't then turn around and try to claim that those people who you involved in your antics are wrong for being upset by them because there are other things going on in the world. Being upset that Jesse Smollett faked a hate crime in order to get better pay or more brand recognition does not mean that you do not care about other issues taking place in the world. You can dislike Jesse and still want to end world hunger. You can think faking a hate crime is wrong and think murdering people is worse. Acting as if people condemning Jesse means they are okay with everything else is ridiculous. Meanwhile, the reason why this story dominated headlines is because that was Jesse's goal. But let's continue. You know what bothers me more than, it's interesting. What bothers me more than someone that says, that motherfucker guilty, he's a liar, he, he did this. What bothers me more than that, those people are irrelevant to me at this point. Mm -hmm. Fuck them. They're gonna believe what they're gonna believe. What bothers me more are the people that are saying, that will say something like, well, even if he did do it, X, Y, Z. I think what you have to realize is, is that for someone like me that represented his entire, my entire career, my, but, my, but more importantly, my entire life, along with my family, represented social justice, represented equity and equality and all of these types of things. And we, we're fighters and we're, we're, we fight with love so deeply. And this is what we preach because it's what we believe. It's like finding out that someone is exactly the opposite of who they claim to be. Mm -hmm. And so I'm a if I had done this, I'd be a piece of shit. Yeah. And I don't think that that is, I don't think that that is kind of, that's not really questionable. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. when people are like, yes, there's a lot of other stuff happening, but that would be really, and again, it's something that I wanted to say if I had done something like this, it would mean that I stuck my fist in the pain of black Americans in this country for over 400 years. Mm -hmm. We're not even talking about in Africa because that's, that's an even deeper, larger conversation. It would mean that I stuck my fist in the fears of the LGBTQ community all over the world. Mm -hmm. I'm not that motherfucker. Never have been, don't need to be. Except that you are, and you do need to be. You can't go to trial and say, hey judge, I wouldn't kill someone. That's just not who I am. Please disregard all the evidence showing you that I did do that and take me at my word that I just wouldn't do this. Saying you simply wouldn't do something bad is not evidence that you didn't do the bad thing. If it were that easy, jails would have no inmates. Jesse could be a wonderful person. And in fact, I think he probably has some decent qualities. He could be a wonderful cook, a nice brother, and a lovely neighbor. But he also paid $3,000 to two men and told them he would help them with their acting career if they helped him fake a hate crime and lie to millions upon millions of people. Didn't need to have a some sort of rise in his career. I was on the up and up. I was coming from New York, from doing a table read for my dream role in a Broadway show. I had just optioned the rights to the autobiography, the authorized autobiography of Alvin Ailey. I had oh. just, all of these things that I was creating, there would be no reason for me to do some dumb, corny shit like that. Uh -huh. But people are gonna believe what they believe, and what I have to do is, I have to keep working. You have to keep working, and that's- And what I know for sure is, every single thing that I auditioned for during that period, I lost. They took it from me. But every single thing that I created myself is being created. Is being created. Never again will anybody be able to pull my life from under me like a rug. There you Never go. Again. Just you small left. Come on, man. Onward. Onward. Uh, and, uh, <clears throat> and so right now you we play freedom because you're free right now. <laughs> Why you say right now? Damn. Right now. I mean, you know, that was good because last time I saw you weren't. <laughs> and now you are. Uh, your stint behind bars, how did you make it through that? What was your saving grace? God. Yeah. And my family. Um, I fasted. I was there for six and a half days. I fasted for six and a half days. Earlier, I spoke about how Jesse's brother, Jaqui, stated that Jesse was placed in the psych ward and directly noted there was a risk of self-harm and self-abusing behavior. He claimed that there would be no reason for that to occur, especially given Jesse's statement during sentencing, and many claimed that Jesse was being harmed in prison. But now we know why he was in the psych ward. He wasn't eating, meaning that Jesse was put in the psych ward in order to monitor his well-being and make sure he wasn't causing physical harm to himself. 
Going on a fast can be a cleansing experience and is often done by people during extreme moments of stress, but it can also be dangerous. The jail making sure he was mentally sound during this time is actually extremely commendable and exactly what they should be doing for their prisoners, not just the celebrity ones. Uh, my lawyer, shout out to Ninye, but he was lying when he said that I was fasting for Lent. Uh -huh. I wasn't fasting for Lent. I was fasting because that's what we do in my family. Like we fast for right. for clarity for i have never in my life at least in my adult life been as clear of mind as i was for those six and a half days and it was almost like when they told me that i was getting out what i was doing is i was fasting until i found out whether or not i was going to be in there for those five and a half months yeah i just wanted to know what my life was about to look like so i was fasting getting and i had been prepping you know my my family most wonderful human beings i live and die for them. you got people. an amazing family yes, let me say that for the oh record you got Jake, an amazing oh Justice God. Smollett Journey. got an amazing oh family yeah, every, yeah. the mom when the i see mom. the mom i'm at attention like waiting for my <laughs> let me tell you something mommy yes. don't go nowhere yes. mommy is a house cat okay mm -hmm. but she was like watch me stay in la and my baby is in chicago like mm -hmm. she she did not play, and um, um, sorry. Uh, yeah. So being um, being being behind bars, uh, I fasted for six and a half days, and there was a part where they told me that I was getting out. I Lord knows I wanted to get out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm in a fucking psych ward on, you know. In, Did they have it, you in a jacket? No, no, okay. no, no. They didn't have me in a jacket, but they had me. I was sleeping on a on like a like a restraint bed. Mm -hmm. I wasn't restrained, and I have to keep it real. Everybody, you know, um, uh, uh, was inside was very kind, and when I left, I thanked them all. I said, I don't know what y'all think either way but the fact that you didn't let me know what you think either way and you just showed me respect i'm grateful for mm. uh -huh. you know um mm. but but yeah i was there in six and a half days and there was a part of me when i was coming out when they told me that i was coming out i was so grateful and so glad to get out but there was a part of me that was like i don't want to lose how i feel right now uh -huh. like i don't want to lose I don't want to lose that clarity. the clarity. Mm -hmm. I don't want to go back out there and pick up this and pick up this, pick up this, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And somehow forget how I feel right now. now. Because right now I am as grounded in me as possible. And it's just, there's something about being in there and having no choice but to surrender. Surrender mm -hmm. not to the system, not to a judge or a bunch of old white men ironically explaining to you about the history of hate crimes and, yeah. and lynching and you're sitting there and being like, what, who the fuck are you? And, but you're surrendering to yourself and you're surrendering to, you're just left there with you, your thoughts and these walls. I believe that the prison system needs to be dismantled. Mm -hmm. I believe that there is, as I'm sitting in there, I'm like, I know that I didn't do this, but you'd have to be, you have to be a, a different kind of person to really search and try to find the redemption in this. Mm. That place is not meant for redemption. Yeah. That place is not meant to make you come out better than when you went in. Mm. Mm -hmm. And the prison system needs to be dismantled. I and mean, I will say that, and, and somehow I feel like maybe that's one of the reasons why. But then I'd look at it and I'm just like, I'm not one of those dudes that needed something like this to happen to understand the plight of my people. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? You like, knew I'm that not before the you went in there. I knew, yeah. you know what I'm saying? I'm yeah. not some ignorant fool that, that, that doesn't understand the history of all of these things that these people somehow try to flip and act like they needed to explain to me. Jesse keeps stating that this is something he didn't need to have explained to him, and that is most definitely true. Jesse was well aware that faking a hate crime against himself 
was not a good thing to do. He knew it was wrong when he did it, which is why he didn't want the police to be involved. Explaining to him that his actions were wrong is mute, because he already knows that. He just refuses to acknowledge that he did them. The interview is then interrupted by one of his co-stars of his film coming on, and they drop the discussion of the hoax there. One of the most infuriating things about this case is the fact that Jesse refuses to take any ownership of his actions, and it's truly doubtful that we will ever hear him admit any wrongdoing. It's everyone else that's lying, not him. Thank you for watching this video, and I hope you enjoyed it. This video, like the previous one about this case, was copyright claimed, and if you would like to support the channel, our Patreon is linked down below. If you want to support this content for free, consider liking and subscribing. If you have any cases you would like to see covered, leave them in the comments, or email me at dreading.official at gmail.com, and I will see you in the next video. Stay safe.